The Day of the Rope by Devin Stack Chapter 14 Ethan didn't want the slice of pizza he was standing in line for. Moments ago, he had been walking down U Street when he noticed a man he could have sworn he'd also seen earlier that day at the White Flint Mall in Maryland. Ethan had noticed the man when he'd been waiting for the metro train, and he'd seen him board the car next to his. An hour had passed since then. There was nothing necess necessarily remarkable about that, which explained why he wasn't panicking. Ethan had taken his sixth name off the list earlier this morning. He thought it was a good idea to be extra cautious. After all, his handiwork had taken place just a few blocks from the White Flint Mall. The man was in his late twenties and wearing a long gray pea coat. He, ought to, he had on black slacks, black leather shoes, a white shirt, and a red tie. In other words, he blended right in. Ethan himself was similarly dressed. What made Ethan suspicious was that the man had an awkward body language about him. It was as if he'd just been caught looking into the girl's locker room and was now trying to appear innocent as possible. His demeanor was that of a shoplifter who was about to exit the store with a coat full of stolen goods. The chances that this man would get off and change trains at the same exact metro stop where Ethan had changed trains were actually very high. Gallery Place was a major hub on the red line, so Ethan had thought little of it when he had seen the man exit the train right after him. He didn't even think it was that odd when he'd spotted the mystery man once again in the U Street metro station, riding on the escalator behind him. It wasn't until Ethan had walked several blocks in no direction in particular and still he spotted this same man about half a block away from him that alarm bells began to go off in his head. Ethan ducked into the nearest doorway as casually as he could. Now it was Ethan that felt as if his body language was that of a thief. He had walked inside a pizza shop that sold pizza by the slice to the evening bar crowd. A jukebox in the corner was blasting loud dance music and a disco ball hung from the ceiling, providing the only source of light in the long, narrow lobby. Several drunk people were there standing in line shouting at each other over the loud music. Behind the counter, an Ethiopian woman was screaming orders over her shoulder to the Ethiopian men dancing to the music in the kitchen. Ethan looked, looked through the large windows that faced the street and examined the people walking by. All he could see was the expected mix of homeless people and intoxicated young people dressed in business attire. No mystery man. He waited several minutes until it was his turn to order, and then acted as if he'd forgotten his wallet. The Ethiopian woman seemed very upset by this. He couldn't ex understand exactly what she was saying because of her thick accent and the loud music blaring on the jukebox, but the look on her face communicated her displeasure with ease. She shouted something unintelligible at Ethan as he apologized and walked out through the entrance of the pizza place and back out onto the street. The man from White Flint was nowhere in sight. Ethan relaxed a little bit. He decided he would still have to make sure that he took a scenic route back to his apartment if he wanted to be on the safe side. After walking several blocks to a random metro station and then changing trains unnecessarily a handful of times to see if he was being followed, Ethan made it back to his apartment without encountering the strange man, or anyone else su suspicious for that matter. Once inside his apartment, he began to take off his coat. 
All at once, every muscle in his body burned and contracted. Ethan fell to the ground with a thud. His muscles were spasming out of control. Was he having a seizure? That's when he noticed the clicking sound. It reminded him some of the sound of his bike it made when he was a child. He taped playing cards to the frame of the bike near the back wheel. The card would make a clicking sound as it struck the spokes of the spinning wheel. Now it was the room that was spinning. And the clicking sound was so loud he couldn't identify its source. Two men were lifting him up off the ground. The clicking had stopped. His hands had been bound behind his back and a gag placed in his mouth. His ankles also seemed bound together. The men placed Ethan in a sitting position on his bed. He could see now that there was also a third man. This man was pointing a handgun directly at his forehead. So this is it, Ethan thought. He smiled as much as he could smile with a gag in his mouth. He hadn't died on his knees like all the rest of the world seemed hell-bent on doing. Totally worth it, Ethan tried to say, but his gag made it impossible to understand him. The man pointing a gun at Ethan looked to be somewhere in his mid-thirties. Something about his build, shaved head, and demeanor made Ethan think he was military. The two other men looked slightly younger. The man on his left was blonde with blonde curly beard and gray eyes. He didn't look like military or law enforcement. He was pudgy and unkempt, like an overgrown dwarf. The man to his right also looked out of place. He was too skinny to be law enforcement and seemed nervous rather than menacing. I apologize for having to do this, Ethan, said the man with the gun. I hope you understand this is for our protection. We know what you're capable of, what you've been up to. Ethan shrugged his shoulders. He didn't care about what they would do to him. He only wished he'd been able to see the public reaction of the confession he'd managed to get out of Brad before he f he'd finished him off. Along with the video confessions, there would be a massive data dump of verifiable emails between Brad and members of Alice's team and Alice Green herself. The data which implicated several members of Green's team in involvement with illegal activity of almost every sort was safely sorted in several different locations including a little known blockchain that would self-publish to various public whistleblower sites when Ethan failed to reactivate the dead man switch. The timing wasn't right, but it would still be a shitstorm and he was going to miss it. The list's been compromised, the man with the gun said. Charlie here found an exploit. He looked at the skinny man to Ethan's right, and the skinny man, Charlie, smiled with embarrassment. He tipped us off. We're on your side, Ethan. That's why we're here, because we need to talk. If I take out your gag, you have to promise not to scream or yell or any of that. I'll put you down if I have to, but I don't think I'll have to. We're on the same team here, Ethan. You understand? Ethan wasn't sure what kind of trick this was, but if they knew about the list, then they also knew he'd been taking people off of it. He shrugged his shoulders. What did he have to lose? The man with the gun nodded at overgrown dwarf, who nodded back and then removed Ethan's gag. Sorry, man, the bearded man said. They started doing it this way because of me. I almost blew his head off, he said, pointing at the man with the gun. I mean, we're killers. Not a good idea to just sneak up on a killer. You can call me Brian, said the man with the gun. Let's get you up to speed. Brian explained that he had begun working the list shortly after Ethan had taken out Ehrenberg. 
the chubby man with the beard who went by Arrow had been the third. That's when Charlie, who had been a contractor for the NSA, had come across a flaw in the list that allowed him to trace the location of people completing the contracts. Charlie had been tasked by the NSA to, with finding a vulnerability in the list, but after researching the names of the people who were on the list, he had realized he didn't want the people working the list to be stopped. The list was unconventional and operated outside of the law, but Charlie knew of far worse things that were perfectly legal and believed that the list was objectively good for society. When he discovered the exploit, he extracted the data necessary to identify some of the more successful operators. Charlie knew that if he'd found the exploit, it was possible someone else might find it too. He needed to warn the list operators before that happened. He'd found Brian first. Brian was ex-military. His wife had started cheating on him while he was deployed in Afghanistan, and he'd become exceedingly reclusive and bitter when he discovered her, her infidelity. Only reason the bitch told me was she got knocked up, and the daddy wasn't white. She let me believe it was mine almost all, almost the all nine of the months. As we got closer to the due date, she kept acting weirder and weirder. I just thought it was because she was pregnant. Then she started getting nervous that I'd find out in the delivery room. So, she finally told me. I kind of lost it after that. Brian had spent day after day on the internet. He began hanging out in, in anonymous message boards and researching the people who had sent so many of his brothers to die in the desert on the other side of the planet. He realized the world was nothing like they had told him. He had watched his friends die to keep a handful of people rich. When the list first appeared on the internet, he was determined to knock off every name himself. When you took out Ehrenberg, that put my butt into gear. I didn't want someone else having all the fun, Brad said, smiling. Charlie and Brian had then tracked down Arrow. He lived in an RV in Nevada, which made him tricky to find. They finally traced his IP while he was parked behind a house in Henderson, Nevada, stealing someone's Wi-Fi. Arrow had been had seen Brian snooping around his RV and thinking it was a fed had blasted a hole the size of a grapefruit through the window of his Winnebago. Ethan found all of this hard to believe. Assuming you guys are who you say you are, how do you know he's for real? Ethan said, pointing at Charlie. Couldn't he just be some fed tracking us all down? I mean, even if you believe him, he was fucking NSA. Brian smiled. That's exactly what I was thinking. So I made him prove himself. How? Ethan asked, skeptical. I made him take a name off the list, Brian said. Charlie smiled and again looked embarrassed. Catherine Lemlin, he said sheepishly. Okay, well, that's all well and good for you, I guess but I don't have any proof of this, said Ethan. Trust no one. That's a good philosophy in these times, said Arrow. We are prepared to demonstrate our loyalties. In fact, we're going to have to see how committed you are before we can trust you with what comes after the list, Brian said. The list is compromised, but our work is far from done. Even if nobody else discovers the exploit, and soon they won't be able to. Charlie here just stumbled, submitted a patch that clears it all up. We just wanted to find you before we closed the door. Even so, they know about the list. Security is going to get tight. They'll set traps. The element of surprise is now gone. So, what's phase two? Ethan asked. War, the three said in unison. End of chapter 14.